Thanks a lot for honoring this appointment. It, it is a great pleasure to have you sitting with us. And, you know, you are one person with your work, you know, you actually making South Africa to be better. And hopefully we will partake in that journey with you as you do great work with MLAP. Thank you. So to kick start, you know, just on a chill bit, you know, who is Derek? You know, we know you're the CEO of MLAP, but who is Derek? Can we just get a bit about you, where you were born and where you went to school? Sure. So... I would describe myself very much as a, as a generalist. So p please don't expect me to be an expert on any very specific topic. Um, I love the creative industry. I love um, how consumers interact, how people think um, and engage with it. And I think that's kind of how I ended up with technology being such a big part of uh, what I do and my passion is that it is a... Uh, it's very connected to humans, so that's how I see it. Um, so I'm not an expert. I hope that, that people don't view me that way. Um, and where I come from, so I was actually born in Tuane. Um, I lived for a very short time as when I was young in um, Namibia, uh, then moved back here. I went to school here, and I ended up studying here, and then made a decision to leave. And I thought I would never come back. I kind of had these big aspirational dreams of what success in the world and, and like if you wanted to be in tech was about. And amazingly, I found my way back here. Um, and I, I love it. And I think it's such a great place. We're glad you found your way back. So where did you go for, for your tertiary education? So here I studied actually at the University of Pretoria. Uh, I did a, a degree in uh, information sciences. Um, as well as marketing. I couldn't decide which I like more, technology or media and advertising. Um, I'm the type of guy who would open a magazine and actually be looking at the ads because I think they're so interesting in the way that they're convincing people and, the, and how they've been put together. So I, I love advertising and marketing as well. So I couldn't decide between those two fields. Was it going to be tech and coding or would I end up in marketing and media? Um, so I tried to study as many things as possible when I was studying. I also thought it was a good strategy to have as many subjects as possible because I knew I would be failing some of them. Um, <laughs> and that strategy did work out for me. So in the end, um, I did my honors year as well. Um, then started out as a coder. So my first job was to code in a very small startup. I was literally the only employee and we were working from a house. Um, I learned a lot because I was a terrible coder. So I was online constantly trying to learn things. And from there, I stumbled upon, I was working on this project and I stumbled upon a job ad for a campaign manager. And I thought that was something a little bit more aligned with my media aspirations. Uh, and it turned out to be a digital marketing uh, job. Uh, South African startup uh, joined it and it grew from strength to strength. And, and that's really how I got into the more of a technology focus. So there's a lot of learning that you did. So if if you could point one thing, you know, in, in terms of your schooling, what is the one learning or subject that has led you to being a CEO today? That, I don't know if, if there is any specific one. I used, to, <laughs> <laughs> I used to hate accounting and I ended up realizing that that becomes like a fundamental core of running any business. Um, and surprisingly, nowadays, I think I'm pretty pretty good at it. I like I, I figured out all of the little tools and and tricks and things that you can do to to make it more understandable for you as a person. I don't think it's it's the same for everyone. I wish I could say like while I was studying that accounting helped position me. Um, and I wouldn't say that this is the same for any CEO or any founder or anyone running a business, um, because of the structure of the of the M Lab, I have a title as CEO, but I wouldn't necessarily compare myself to to big corporate CEOs. Um, but to answer your question, I think the the best thing I learned, and this is probably because I was a I was a bad student that had to um, was not very academically focused. Um, I had to do a lot of quick learning. Um, to make sure I, I passed my exams, make sure that I produced my projects. Um, 
And I think it's that learning and that ability to quickly learn and adapt and find ways of getting your message across or your product across, kind of selling. Those were all things that I that I learned while I was studying. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a skill that developed. So, uh, you know, with you studying, with, what was your first job? The, the first formal job that you can say you stayed a bit longer on it? I would say that was the that was the campaign management role I had down in um, Cape Town. Uh, prior to that, I did coding for this small startup, and prior to that, I tried to code some of my own things that I thought were going to be big businesses. Uh, I was under the illusion that when you have an idea and you you have some of the skills to produce the product, that that meant you had a business. And I also kind of had a misinterpretation of what success meant. The idea that you had a product, it was working, why is it not a huge success and why am I not retiring already at like 23? <laughs> so so <laughs> I think that was kind of my journey. But the, the longest job I had and probably uh, you know, my entire career um, was the digital marketing one. Um, and that exposed me to many other industries like to... To do digital marketing, had to understand retail because we were doing a lot of retail. And uh, some of the clients that we were working with were um, the Ebays and the Walmart. Yeah. So there was a lot of product element in there. We were trying to figure out what people were searching, uh, looking at what people were searching, what their thoughts were around this. Where did they st first hear about this? So that kind of pulled me into traditional media understanding. So that was a pretty cool job. And I think I learned a lot from it. From it. So with you starting out at, at MLab, you know, maybe let's start, you know, some people might not know what's MLab. Can you just tell us a bit of what, what is MLab and what are you guys doing there? Okay. So MLab, um, I'm going to ask my team to raise their hands. That's MLab. Um, <laughs> it is a group of very passionate young people um, who believe that technology can change the world, but not because of technology, because of the people that it impacts and the people that it involves. So that's MLab, and by trying to achieve our goal, we do a, a number of things. So we have a number of programs. At the core of it, always focusing on young people, so youth, um, on talent, and the concept and what drives us is believing that if we can equip them with technology skills, so we have some academies, uh, the Code Tribe team is welcome to raise their hand. So these are the young people who are teaching other young people how to code, uh, to think strategically, to use methodologies like Agile, um, led primarily by our, our provincial managers and Rulani back there is a, a Scrum Master, Lebos is a Scrum Master, c has done his Scrum work, how to manage and think about and implement design thinking and project management in very agile ways. So we have our training academies. Okay. Uh, and then the notion is that those young people can go and get employment within industry with their with their new skills and talent, and potentially some of them will choose a direction into becoming problem solvers, uh, potentially with the hope of becoming a startup or an entrepreneur. So for that, we have our accelerators, and that's where we support startups or fledgling startups or founders or even those that are going from a stage of problem solving to becoming an innovator. So we don't see everyone as an entrepreneur um, from the start, so very talent-driven. Um, and then we have very interesting programs and the teams are evolving at levels leading uh, a lot of the work in terms of, of building out youth-led innovation. So how do we do it in very lean ways? How do we involve youth in it? How do we um, really drive transdiscipline uh, where you have many different skills coming together and taking them out of their boxes with the skills that they have and pushing them into thinking with a different hat on and trying to solve real problems. Um, but that's really the MLab. We're a nonprofit company uh, in its most simple definition, some sort of hybrid like Tendai is trying to do. Tendai does our M&E work, so he does our minute ma uh, measurements and trying to, to see where we have impact. And um, it looks like we're more of a hybrid between an incubator and accelerator. Um, but that's really what, what our core focus is. Just so that you don't lose me, can you just explain what is Agile? Agile. Okay. So Rulani is probably going to censor me after this. But, but <laughs> Agile 
is to try and focus on very lean and open input environments when it comes to project management. So we have traditional project management where, I mean, one of the terms is waterfall. So you overscope something, you all agree to it, and you deliver on it. Mm -hmm. With Agile, um, you try and produce workable components after sprints, and sprints are generally two week long focused development mm -hmm. periods. Um, but it's a very innovative and, and uh, growing way of actually, firstly, interpreting design thinking into projects, making sure that stakeholders are involved, the project owners are involved. But I think what's core of it is that you give ownership to the developers or the team developing it. It's their decision what they what they work on. It's their commitments. It's their own contract with each other to deliver on. So you are implementing significantly more accountability into a project than you would in traditional traditional project needs. And then what is your footprint nationwide in terms of your satellite offices at MLAP? So so currently our core our core lab is here at the Innovation Hub in Tuane. Um, that, not, that also includes an academy, so our larger academy is down here as well on the same campus. Then we have um, academies in Soweto now, a growing academy, so we're scaling that one up. We're in Timbisa uh, with a small academy and with the hope of actually scaling that. And then we're in Braamfontein now, primarily focusing on youth from Alex. Uh, so that kind of constitutes our Gauteng environment. Okay. Also led with um, Cicely in the back there who runs the Lean Innovation programs with uh, Johannesburg students. So he has started creating a base for us at Resolution Circle with the University of Johannesburg. And then in Cape Town, Lebo leads our pro province program down there, primarily based at the waterfront within Workshop 17. Um, Lebo has done some other programs outside of that environment as well. And then at the current moment, we are in the process of now opening offices and setting up offices or labs uh, within Kimberley and Khalashiwe, uh, within the Northern Cape, Polokwane and Limpopo, and then now in discussions with partners in Mapumalanga to also bring a program there. But then how does one become incubated or how does one actually become part of the startups that you are working with? So, when we originally started, we had this open door policy, and this was in 2012. So the ecosystem has evolved significantly. Um, both the startups, founders, innovators, all have matured and are maturing much quicker than they did in those days. Uh, there were also a lot fewer ideas being developed at that time. So our program has evolved from having a very open policy program to not having quite structured entry mechanisms. So the best way to enter is to kind of like start joining our community, start joining our ecosystem, following us. But then our primary entry points are through our website. Um, we define each of the programs there. We do our announcements there when we open the program. Typically our program runs uh, with startups because we look at two ways of supporting startups. So either we can do capacity funding, so this means that we're not going to give you money as a grant or a seed fund. We will provide you with some sort of service, some sort of support mechanism. And that often includes money, but it but it's within our ecosystem. We would okay. we would resource what you are what you need. Or we have a program where we do seed funding as well. So early stage seed funding up to five hundred thousand Rand. Um, Generally, it's a little bit less than that, but the idea there is that the uh, that you take this money, take your concept, and get it to a validated product. So we want to see something built in quite a short period of time. It's not a lot of money, so the, the period of time and milestones are not that big as well. We want to see that you, you've built something and want you to test it. So come back with the learning. So that's kind of where our seed focus is. Okay. And that opens up as a season. So we'll do a call to say we've now opened up the call for applications, uh, people would apply. We would run a very short pre-accelerator program. So we'll work a little bit with you prior to you doing your pitches. We then come and pitch to a panel that we've put together. It's not just MLab, it's our stakeholders as well, um, potentially some VCs or partners. Mm -hmm. They would give input and we then make a selection on our, on our startups. That's generally, that process can run up to three months depending on the, the volume of applications that we receive. So now a person walks in, whether via, via social media or through your front door, 
is it someone that must be tech savvy or if i come to say you know what i have this brilliant idea can you work with me even though i have no technical skills we would say i would say no but i would not say it's because of your skill that's the problem there's a fundamental problem in many people having an idea so you're a problem solver you've identified a problem you've now decided that you have a solution for that problem in the vast majority of cases you come and knock on our door first or, or entities like us you have done no validation out there because you're afraid that someone's going to steal your idea or that your idea is so unique so you have no validation that makes it very difficult for us to work with you secondly there is not a single startup or successful s startup out there. And, and we're not talking very early stage. We talk about those that actually succeed and grow and scale that are based on a single founder. Like, you ha like it's best to have multiple founders. It's best for you to try and structure a team together before you come and engage with us. Mm -hmm. There can be gaps in that team. And that's where we play a role is to then see how we help fill those gaps. But it's not, a, uh, it's not the ideal situation for you to come with an unvalidated idea knock on the door and being a single person and expecting that to evolve into an actual solution. Okay. And in terms of the people that are incubated, what challenges are they currently facing or is there any stumbling with them or are they actually striving in terms of what they've developed? It's very much a mix of it. Um, I don't believe there's a single startup or pre-startup or some sort of solution that has exactly the same problems. Uh, and this is often a, a flaw with many of the incubation programs is that they try and put a menu down and tell you exactly what you will be learning. It's not a school. Uh, you are already ahead of everyone else in, in your, your cohort and even in our organization by having identified a problem and having found a solution for it or a proposed solution for it. So you need to drive your your success and identify impediments and be clear on what those impediments are so that we can assist you or partners outside of our organization can assist you. But we find that the most successful ones have very unique problems and they're very clear on what those problems are and what they're asking for instead of sitting back and kind of waiting for someone to deliver all of the uh, secret source, like Lebo taught me earlier, like the secret source for each of these problems. What I can say seems to be typical type of things, and I think this is um, primarily because we deal with youth, because of the economy that we're in, uh, because of very much driven by legacy issues in, in our country, um, very bad architecture in terms of society, in terms of where people live and where they need to go to, to work and access resources. Transport remains a major issue. Um, the ability to afford to come out, the ability to have the freedom to participate in being an entrepreneur or wishing to be an entrepreneur. Because if you are qualified, there is an expectation on you to get a job. Um, many people have invested in you getting there and it's time that you start giving back. So that's a reality. It's difficult for anyone who is employed to build a business. Uh, on the sideline because again there's a lot of pressure on us as employees if you're an employee to be highly productive because of the economy that we're in um, so we know time is a is an issue transport is an issue the ability to afford things is a big issue and a big problem in terms of affording things is data so the industry that we're in and where we focus with technology and mobile a lot of the resources are available. There's great resources, on, resources online. You can do amazing stuff online. Uh, our industry loves preaching cloud and all of these amazing things that are available, but they're all dependent on data and your consumers to consume them, they're dependent on data. And in South Africa, our entrepreneurs access to data, reliable data, internet connections are still a man fundamental impediment in, in many of the great ideas and teams getting to the next step. With you working with a lot of entrepreneurs generally out there, outside of MLIP, what are the big challenges that tech entrepreneurs are faced with? Skill. Uh, often the, the tech entrepreneur is not necessarily the techie. 
So they're not necessarily the person who can actually build the solution. In rare cases, they are. And even then, it becomes a problem because now they're so focused on purely building the technologies that they don't focus on the actual role of the entrepreneur, which is unlocking the, the market, building the business relationships, securing the investment, getting first paying clients, doing the accounting and all of the administration that goes with it. So firstly, it's the availability of skill from a technical perspective. It's the affordability of those skills because there's a limit off them and because there's huge demand in private sector for them as well as public sector, um, they are paid quite well. So it's very expensive for a startup to try and get the right resources in. Um, there's a misunderstanding still in terms of what my expertise is and what your expertise is in terms of the market. So if you are technology driven and that's what brought you to the solution, you might have identified a problem in the post office or in the hospital or the clinic, but you don't necessarily understand the health environment or the agricultural environment. So having access to both non-technical resources as well um, that are a little bit more cross-discipline than yours, that's, that's a big one. And then the ultimate one, which everyone would always tell you and which most of the organizations would tell you is not a problem, um, is money. Really, we have a limit of early stage funding for entrepreneurs in this country. Uh, we don't have the privilege in a majority of cases to have friends and family investment, um, not in something like technology. I think South Africans' con context of investment are quite, quite tangible still. So property investment, investment in education, those type of things, but not necessarily tech. And with MLIP, you know, holistically look at you know your, your solutions how are you helping to solve challenges that our country is faced with we don't i would say like our role is not to to dictate what people do but we do have a preference for impact stuff i don't think as an organization we would ever take credit for the success of any of the startups that we worked with we're a single entity within this ecosystem that helps them and Again, the reality in South Africa is you might need multiple partners. You might be to be in multiple accelerators or incubators or support programs or ED programs. You're not going to succeed with a single player. So we don't take the success or the drive of the startup. That's really on them. Um, but we do play our role and we do prefer projects that have some sort of impact level. I don't think that is unique in the South African, the African or the majority world markets. It is exactly there where the opportunities lie, is in the areas where we have a lack of service delivery, where we have major social economic issues, uh, economic gaps. So there is a tendency that pretty much anything you can think of, you can define some sort of impact. Um, we try and put them into some verticals. We have a strong focus on health these days. So we like the, the concept of the mobile health and wellness environment. So there's a strong focus for us there. We have seen great things coming from education. Uh, we've, in the early days, did quite a lot of transport mobilization. So using technology to improve that. There's a focus on agriculture and food security. Um, but again, I think if, when we look at the M Lab, these are all outputs from investing in talent. So if there's one area where we can drive impact, it's making sure that more youth are involved, that they form part of the innovation process, and that they ultimately own the assets that get created. So that's really where we focus from. Okay, but now, how do you ensure that you're inclusive in terms of the reach with the entrepreneurs? So there's someone in Atridgeville, there's someone in Deep KZ and Mlazi. How do you reach those people so that you can help out? It's, it's a very difficult question. It's something we struggle with since inception. Um, and I have to say, unfortunately, we can't serve everyone. We can't help everyone. Um, there is huge demand. There's a lot of urbanization happening. We know that many of the youth that are part of the program, busy creating skills, etc., they often do come to Gauteng as well, or they go to the Western Cape. The best we're trying to do at the moment is to expand our footprint into more rural provinces. But even then, those programs would be quite urbanized. They would generally be in a city center. And this 
goes back to the restrictions we spoke about earlier is the fact that what we do, you can't do if you're, you're not on decent internet, on a decent internet connection. Uh, if you don't have access to commas, and if you don't have an environment where you're close to potential supporting partners and decent infrastructure. So ultimately, I think we are, in many cases, restricted to, to where we can run our programs and who we can help. Um, the best we're doing at the moment is to say that our focus is on youth, our focus is on impact-based solutions, and that we understand that we work with talent and not just entrepreneurs. So we're quite early stage and not necessarily at the end of that, at that funnel. So can we ask the people in the room if they have any solution on how you can reach those entrepreneurs? Any takers? Anyone um, who can help out? <laughs> but then I think there must be a few questions. Does anyone have a question for Derek? Hi, Derek. Hi. Uh, my name is Paseka. Hi, Paseka. Um, so what I wanted to know is that the people that you led in into, you know, startup grind and everything, and you spoke about talent, what do you mean by talent? How do you sort of evaluate that? Because one of the problems that I'd seen for a lot of young entrepreneurs, and I will say specifically um, black entrepreneurs, it's very hard to just pitch uh, something that is sustainable and profitable, you know. It's like you always have to have this whole thing of, I'm going to see the community, you know, sort of women and children sort of thing. Where is your idea really is all about the sustainable business is what it is. So, but in short, I want to know, how do you define talent? You know, when you look at someone, you say, there's a person I'm looking for. It's a very good question. I would say, like, firstly, if we look at skills, if we're trying to find talent through aptitude or skill, then there isn't necessarily a restriction. With our with our funnels, like our academies, where we're trying to produce software developers or those with the technical skills, there we have some requirements in terms of saying, look, you have to have some science or mathematics at school. Preferably, you're an unemployed graduate from uh, an ICT background, but it's not limited to that. But that's very much focusing on purely the technical element of it. When it comes to the accelerators, we rarely delve into what you studied or what you're doing currently. We're very focused on what you're trying to achieve. And the passion element, while it might seem that it's difficult to, to communicate, it is often picked up quite easily by those that are evaluating you. Like we can see if you have a passion for it. Within our program, we're not overly concerned with the commercial viability or the sustainability of the, the project or the concept because we're quite early stage focused. So we're more interested in the functional value that you bring, not the commercial value. So can you communicate properly in terms of what the benefit is that you give to the user. Are you going to save them time? Are you going to save them money? Are you going to improve their health or life? Like, what is that functional value? Why would they want to use your product? We're going to invest our time and our money into you so that you can go and validate it. Because not you nor, our, nor we know for certain whether that's going to be a success. If you can convince us through the validation process or the development process, that there's real demand for it, then there generally is some sort of commercial model that can be developed for it. Um, I would say this though, from a large majority of the entrepreneurs that we meet, it's good to have a big vision. It's good to sell that big dream, but you can't just do that. Often it comes across as you're trying to solve really complicated problems, which even governments and foundations and international agencies cannot solve with all of the resources that they have. They're struggling to solve it. It's not saying your solution won't contribute to solving it, but you shouldn't be taking on all of that responsibility and trying to convince us that you will be the one solving it. Often editing down your idea is also a good thing. So when you are trying to sell us the big vision, just trim it down and show us what is actually possible at least possible in the first year, the first two, three years um, that can come out of there. 
But talent, I would say, is a very difficult thing to define. It's more a case of, of passion and, and believing whether that individual has the ability to, to make that project work in a reality. Um, the one skill I think you need as, a, as an entrepreneur, if you're focused, we wouldn't consider everyone an entrepreneur coming in. You might be a founder of a business. It's not meaning that it's commercially viable yet. The one skill you're going to have to have is the ability to connect people and convince people. And that includes building teams. So can you convince someone else to join your company and build a solution when you can't pay them a lot of money or any money at all sometimes? And can you then convince people to invest or buy the product? So there's a lot of business development that's actually uh, more of an aptitude than it is a skill. Sorry, it's a very long-winded answer. I hope that... Oh, so, okay. Just on that, so is there an opportunity for some of us in this room to be a feeder to MLAP? Because you're dealing with people that are already there. So if, like Paseko was saying, so if he can sort of be a feeder of talent, so he deals with the people, gets them to a certain level, and then comes to MLAP with those people to say, there are, here are people that you can work with, and vice versa. Those that come to you that you can't work with, do you have people that you send those people to so that they can de develop further before they come back? 100%. So I think we've, we know this is an entity. There's been a lot of research on the MLAP, so there's, I don't know how many white papers the World Bank have produced on it, but the, one of the core values that, that seem to be coming out for our members is the ability to, to tap into our network and, and interconnect. We have a shortage of, of entrepreneurs. We have a, a strong focus because of all the work we do on the, on the technologists and those that, that, that can innovate and solve problems. We often don't have the entrepreneurs. So there is a lack f and an interest for us to try and pull in more talent coming into the program, um, across programs. We don't exist in a vacuum. We're quite a vertical program as a, as a mobile or a tech accelerator. Any more questions? Hi, okay. uh, Derek. Um, I just wanted to find out about your experience as a, you said you worked in a media startup. Um, so I just wanted to know how, how did you, um, how do you run a digital business, a media company within a space that is overcrowded, like in the internet, you know, when you go, there's so many media companies out there and you all competed for attention and for customers. How did you, in your experience, how did you run that uh, that business? I would say we were quite, the, the startup that I was referring to, we were quite fortunate in that it was very early days. So it was digital marketing. And very few people know this, but South Africans actually played a very strong role in being some of the biggest agencies. They were, in the beginning, a lot of opportunities within the gambling sector until Google decided to implement rules. So there were a lot of companies doing international online gaming marketing. Uh, we focused on, on a lot more retail and travel, which was an emerging sector. So there wasn't that much competition for us at that point. Um, but I think it's the case with, with any type of business. If you can't differentiate, you're not going to survive or you shouldn't complain if there are competitors pushing you out you are also competing with a lot of legacy capital, unfortunately, in South Africa. Um, these, these companies are giants. They have a lot of capital in the media sector, so they do dominate. But I think the areas that they are missing is they're not creating hyper-local content yet, and they're not necessarily making it available as easily and as freely as they could. So I think you have to identify the the potential unique opportunities that you can tap into that differentiate you from from the big guys and the big media media organizations. I spent some time in my career as well working for for traditional media, so magazines. We were looking at um, tapping into and evolving some brand extensions or building new solutions on top of it. And the element there was that the knowledge of your dem your demographic and the psychographic of the people that that were reading the magazines. They told you a lot about what you could and couldn't do. And the adoption rates were very high because it was very focused. It was very niche. Um, and from that, you can grow it. But it is a media is a very broad term these days. Uh, one would have to kind of like define a little bit more to, to kind of sit and, and evaluate and develop a strategy for competing with it. 
Derek, in terms of the tech scene in South Africa, what is the state of it and what do you think needs to happen to to get it to the next level? We're not there yet at the level of the Silicon Valley. So what is the current state and what needs to happen to actually push further? Okay. I would say we're very much in infancy stage. If you look at the if we look firstly at the corporate environment, so South Africa and, and most markets, and South Africa was kind of the, the core market, we're starting to see more offices popping up across Africa as well. But South Africa was a sales division for most tech companies, right? They didn't do their R&D here. Um, they're not focusing on a lot of development work or innovation work. They were here to sell things from other markets. So there's very limited activity that happened there a lot of marketing investment that, that came with it. If we look at the maturity of the tech hub, the tech community, the tech uh, incubator environment, South Africa as well as the rest of Africa, it's really in its infancy. To compare it to some tech giants or tech startup giants or those that we kind of like look up to and, and put on pedestals as like, this is what we should be building. Tech hubs in general are about four and a half years old. So all of them together, that's the average age of the majority of tech hubs in, in Africa, including South Africa. That means Facebook is older. That means WhatsApp is older. Uber is older. Airbnb is older. All of these, com all of these startups that we position are older than tech hubs and, the, and really the tech ecosystem or the open entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we are very much still in an infancy stage. Um, there's great results coming from it. There's good success coming from it. It's brilliant to see organizations like, like Standard Bank investing more in it uh, and driving it. But we should not be discouraged by not having the big results yet. They will come. We're starting to see more and more people get involved in it. Uh, and it's really about ecosystem building at, at the moment. I think that's what, that will unlock all of the successes and big innovations and the unicorns, African unicorns that will develop. I would say this, I'm not the only one that says this uh, within our ecosystem, but modeling it on Silicon Valley is the wrong thing. Like we should not be aspiring to it. We should not be building towards it. It isn't a reality for us um, and it shouldn't be. There's a lot of, lot of elements that are not taken into consideration. If you wanna know where Silicon Valley came from, there's a huge amount of government military spending that helped stimulate that ecosystem. A lot of manufacturing that helped stimulate that ecosystem. So there was a lot of money, a lot of profit that was made that was able to reinvest in itself into all of the new solutions that sit on top of all of those, those technologies. We're not in that space. We're not producing microchips and, and the silicon so we need to think about our ecosystems very differently. Uh, we need to look at our strengths, just like a startup would look at their strengths in, in the market, and then figure out what our ecosystem should be and what to expect from it. So with us sitting in this room being entrepreneurs, what opportunities are there for us in the mobile space? Mobile, I would say, it has be look mobile in the traditional terms of, of applications, those icons you get on your phone. Remember, we started out in 2012 around this. It was a very crowded ecosystem in terms of platforms. Um, and you would build an app for almost everything. I think it's evolved. I think now apps are really systems. Um, they are the new ICT systems. But the opportunities that are still there is those applications being either evolved or being built on top of great data and understanding that data and engineering the data. There's opportunities within machine learning. That's big opportunities currently. It's not as complicated as people think. It's worth investing time there if you want to still build businesses on top of it. Gaming and, and creative content, there is a huge gap for, for South Africans and Africans in general to build within that sector. Um, the health space is still quite open. There's not a lot of consumer or self-populated user solutions out there yet. 
So we're seeing wearables, we're seeing things coming through, but they are not localized yet. They're not speaking to the real issues or solutions that, that are possible within the African context. Um, something good happened last month with, with Google finally opening up their merchant uh, capabilities for South African app developers. So I think suddenly there is uh, rejuvenation and what the opportunities are for, for building actual app businesses. Previously, we used to evangelize the opportunities of app businesses with the understanding that you couldn't actually commercialize them that well. You'd have to find very traditional ways. You had to either direct sell advertising or you would have to have your own subscription models or use a website to first get people there and then just using the application. Now, finally, it's kind of rejuvenating this opportunity of building apps that you can actually charge for and actually engage with and have an economy in it. Um, I think there's also nothing wrong with looking at really good solutions, global ones, that haven't localized yet and that aren't available here yet. There's nothing wrong with kind of like duplicating some of those things in a better way, in a more localized way. Um, because it opens up an opportunity for you to either own that market or it's preparing yourself for potentially being procured if those players do come to the market. Do you have any questions? One other, please go to the question, but just <laughs> IoT. So I know there's quite a lot of hype around it, but there is a reality around it. Um, I think looking at some of the most recent stats, we're looking to say that that the mobile penetration um, numbers, you know these numbers that they generally throw out of like 110% mobile penetration, uh, where it's more than the amount of people. We know now with more realistic statistics that there, it's closer to 80% and that it's growing. Uh, we know that the, the smartphone penetration is is sitting around just about 46% and is growing. But what's interesting is that already about 11 million subscribers are they defined as being devices. So that, that Internet of Things devices, those smart devices or interconnected devices, already about 11 million of them in Africa subscribers are actually these machines. That means there's a big opportunity for it still because I think it would be rare for someone in this room to, to give us really good examples of how this is being implemented. So it means that there's still a lot of space. And with that becomes additional industries like the analytics of things. So what do you do with that data? How do you utilize it and improve on it? And the maintenance of things. Like once these smart devices or smart city devices are installed, who's going to maintain it? So again, I think that's just a almost like a side vertical sector that, that's ripe for for South African startups to actually take advantage of. Sorry. Hi, Derek. Hi. Um, this is Tiro. Um, I just recently finished my metric. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, so I want to ask about the space of the young entrepreneurs that you guys have in your programs in terms of there's a lot of, I'd say, pressure on, like, on social media platforms giving the sort uh, um, false perception of what entrepreneurship is like, you know, having the private jets, having the everything. So how have you guys managed to give the uh, young entrepreneurs in your programs the reality of what entrepreneurship is? I don't think it takes a lot to give them the reality. I think like once you step into it, you become sober very quickly. You very quickly realize what the realities is. The best that we can do is kind of put some additional pressure on you. Uh, the one learning that we've we've learned over the last five years and that we're still working on improving is that we were so aware of those pressures that we were trying to relieve them and kind of like keep you oblivious to them. But we're realizing now that we may we need to actually put the more pressure on you to realize that. I do agree with you. I think like our there's nothing wrong with having those goals. It's very possible for an entrepreneur to have a private jet and and, and be very successful uh, financially if that's your definition of success. But I do think one of the biggest misconceptions again is that we we idolize uh, and almost worship these single individuals. We say that Facebook is Mark Zuckerberg, right? Like and and then we we think that's what it takes to be a startup. 
and it's not. Like, you need co-investors, you need co-founders. Your businesses will be built by people that work for you, the talent that actually build it. So this notion, and we see this a lot, is that when entrepreneurs step in, they want to be the only person in the program. They want to delay the time they take in terms of structuring a team around them, um, giving ownership to some of those that are investing their time in the business. And I'm talking about the actual talent. So if you're lucky enough to secure a developer that believes in your idea, often the entrepreneurs are slow in actually making them part of the business. These promises of we will pay you and we can pay you and if the business does well, but you're not releasing equity of your business to them. So I think that's the biggest misconception that media is driving with young entrepreneurs, that you are almost the musicians. Like I know um, Michel once told, Michel from Geek Culture once told me, this is, this is like every young person is aspiring to be a musician because those are the, the rock stars and the, the money and they're the, the cool people in the spotlight. And unfortunately, we're painting entrepreneurs as being those same people, but it's very different. Like you're not a solo artist. You have to have quite a big band, a symphony in, in fact, to be successful. Any takers with question? There's a hand right at the back. Hi, it's Mlando Gomez speaking. I just have a question around when you say, for example, you said we pref will prefer if there's a group of people who come with an idea. They've already worked that idea out. And uh, I think most of current solution nowadays, they, they require a multidisciplinary uh, uh, skills, diverse skills, you know. They are not necessarily purely tech, tech skills or what. You find that they combine a lot of dis different dis uh, disciplines within coming with a solution. But then where is the platform to collaborate in order to come with such ideas? Because uh, because it looks like you already want people who've already met somewhere and they are now uh, want to grind out now that they, 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 you're finding a solution and how to go about it. But I think there's, uh, there's uh, something missing before. How do they actually get to meet, uh, actually if they have, they have diverse skills and what? That's basically my question. There, there isn't an easy solution to it. I think the... Um Firstly, you're 100% right. So, so this is one of the reasons we started implementing the Demola program that, that we run as well. It's specifically around those, those transdisciplines or multidisciplinary work. And it's not just startups or individuals facing those issues, it's big corporates as well. Um, they tend to be focused and have a lot of engineers, but they don't have some of the other disciplines to help them innovate. Uh, maybe just to correct myself, if that's, if that's the message that came across, our work with you is to help you continue to define that solution and do a lot of the matching and bringing in some knowledge and new perspectives to what you're trying to achieve with your idea. What we would prefer is if, you, if you're not the only person and that you haven't only tested it with us so that you have shown that you have the ability to convince someone else to join you on solving this problem. Your idea doesn't have to be purely defined or perfectly defined. In fact, in most of the cases, we rarely see someone who has ended the program with the perfect idea. Um, our pre-accelerator work helps you a little bit in trying to define it, looking at the user stories and trying to look at what the technologies are. So we offer some sort of platform within the, in the traditional acceleration program. But I think the Demola program at the moment speaks the best to it. So just to, to give a bit of insight on the Demola program, it's a Finnish-based program. It, it runs in a number of countries. Um, and what it does here is it takes talent, and the talent is generally defined as university students that are still studying. In South Africa, we have an interest in those that are either in their six-month practicals or that they, have, they are unemployed graduates, so they have some skill. We match that up with an industry problem and an industry partner that plays a role in it. And industry doesn't have to be big corporate. So globally, actually around 70% of the solutions that get put into these demolas are coming from startups. 
there is a catch to it though and this is this is where south african founders or the as entrepreneurs or those aspiring to be entrepreneurs still need to catch up with the global trend and the global understanding of how these things work within the demola model the talent that helps develop the solution owns their intellectual property and you have the rights and the ability to negotiate with them and get a shared license or potentially join with them to drive it but those young individuals that have created and come up with solutions and methods around the problem you've identified truly are the owners of that intellectual property but this is where we run into a lot of issues i have a problem i've identified that it's really difficult to get my car license renewed and now i think i own this entire ecosystem and the startup that should come out of it i don't want to release any of the ip so i don't work with anyone else so i think there are few people like you that might be interested in having a, a cross discipline true open environment of collaboration but there's still a lot of work to be done done to it and the onus is on us as an organization and many other organizations as well is to create that platform to allow that um and i think a big definition of that is to try and create a safe place for for people to to share their ideas and try and reduce the risk of them losing that because it seems the fear of losing your potential startup or the idea of your startup is often more than what is often put forward as the fear of failure like we i don't know what it is but south africans seem to want to keep their ideas very close to themselves they don't want to collaborate just before we go to the gentleman you know dealing with tech people i don't know if you worked with someone who's a developer how do you move a person from being tech based to being a business there's a lot of apps there's a lot of people that are doing a lot of great work but how do you get them to be viable and to literally make money out of it i've seen a lot of techies who are going to bed hungry i'm sorry to say that but how does m lab help me with my tech to actually be a business okay so first thing is you don't change people ever mm-hmm. you can you can create environments for them to grow into a direction that they could have likely done so if they had the right resources or they might still do so but a a pure techy that doesn't want to be an entrepreneur or run a business is not going to become an entrepreneur and run a business because we take you through some sort of magic program to do that that's a very personal thing you you are who you are what we can say is that we we see there is success is when a techy is really good at solving problems and loving it and good at building they do become and build successful businesses for building products and solving problems uh for other people so you sell your skills so that seems to be some of the success areas where we see see young people or young developers succeeding um this is actually going to be a global trend for any industry like whether you're an engineer or a designer or a teacher um freelancing and selling your time uh, independently is is pretty much going to be the future if you're going to so you're not going to sleep work for big corporates anymore so we're seeing that shift that's it if someone has the uh, let's say it is a tech a techy they're really good at building a product or a or a suite of services to sell against themselves they have an interest in having a business the best we can do is expose you and kind of help you find clients give you a safe environment to test some of your things so we do quite a we have a very strong internal economy in a sense so many of our startups we support by supporting another startup to deliver some services to to themselves so there's an internal economy it's a bit more of a safer environment to test whether you are good at running businesses we can give you some tools we provide you with some training and exposure to things but again i have to note that we are a very vertical program we specialize and try and evolve what we're doing but you need more partners 
you need to move from product development and prototyping potentially to an incubator accelerator, an enterprise development program with a corporate that is now very specifically geared towards saying, here's the accounting that you need to follow. Here's the legislation that you need to follow, the policies you need to put in place. Or you've now accessed customers, how do you scale them? It's a big problem with many incubators. You're tr everyone's trying to offer all of the services. It's like, if you're gonna build a business, we can help you do the entire lifespan of your business. We can help you get from idea to retirement or scaling or exiting. And looking at most incubators, programs, support programs, no one has the resources to do that. Um, so the best we do is to try and link you up with the next ste step. So we'd say like, well, look, there's VC programs, there's programs, there's a, a ED program. Some of our startups have moved into internal programs with big corporates, for example, so into their R&D teams or into the enterprise development programs. I hope that answers it. It's, it's not a, it it's not a clear cut <laughs> solution, unfortunately. Can we just have the last question? Was that Mike? Hi, um, so I'm very curious. So you have a lot of programs uh, taking place. Now, how do you define the graduation criteria? Do startups graduate or, or after they graduate, do you still continue engaging with them? How does that work? So traditionally, the answer has been no to this point. So we've had some startups that we have continued supporting for up to three or four years. Um, now with the work Tendai is doing with us is to try and define at what, what point can we stop helping them? At what point do we kind of like create illusions that we're still helping? And where do we need to be clear that, look, we can get you this this point, and here is the, the three partners that we want to get you on to into the next stage. So that kind of defines the, the graduation. At the moment, the graduation seems best defined by saying you have built a technology or a product and you have validated it. So this isn't your MVP minimum um, viable product. Uh, minimum viable. viable product. This is your minimum validated product. You've gone and tested it or you've gotten feedback on it and you can iterate it. We think at that stage, we need to now either develop a new program that's very core and focused to it. So, so the work that Dai and Alex, who isn't here tonight, is doing is to kind of define what additional parallel training and, and effort we can do. But we think that's the, the point we can help you. And, and that's generally when the money we can give you um, as a seed grant also kind of runs out. But you should now be at a point where you have all of the, the tools and the kit to access our network of other investors, angel investors, etc. So at the moment, that's defined as the, as the graduation. We don't have a single startup that we stop engaging with. So the best definition we have for them at the moment is alumni. It still feels a little bit far out, like that all of the work is on them, but we do stay in touch. So we, our model is to, to track your economic and socioeconomic development value that you're bringing. And often the best results come after you leave us, right? So when we are interested in how many people you're employing uh, and how your business is growing, that's actually post our program. So that's why we have an interest in continuing the relationship with you. And we often also, during those stages, continue to stumble onto potential partnerships, potential funding, potential grants that you could access and, and um, get into. I would say the work is with us at the moment is to make sure that we can define a strong enough value proposition for you to wanna continue being part of our our family. So we kind of see it as a, as a startup family ecosystem. Okay. So Derek, in wrapping up, you know, there's a lot of misconception of people believe MLab might be just a single focused, you know, entity. You know, can you just broaden the different things that you would that you were doing at MLab and how does the next three years look? You know, what great startups are coming out of MLab? Okay. So First off, I think the big misconception is that we are a traditional incubator 
and whether people have different definitions of what an incubator is, doesn't matter. They view us as an incubator, and that means that you would come to us and we would help you be a successful business. Secondly, they think because we, we focus on technology, that that's really what we are trying to achieve, is to say that we want to solve problems with technology. And that's true. It's an output of what we're trying to do. But, but our real work is around talent development. So we're looking at how we can get youth more involved in the research, development, and innovation sector. And to do that, we want to develop skills. We want to give opportunities in terms of solving real problems. We want to invest in some of those. We want to see those become businesses so that they employ, that they actually create impact in many different layers. Um, so I guess if, if I could clarify those things, that would make me happy is that don't view us as an incubator and we're serving entrepreneurs because we're not. We're serving that whole value chain in the hope that some entrepreneurs will come out of it. So that's really where our focus is. Um, so very much a learning organization. Like I said earlier, we're, like this entire industry is young. So it's... Um, scary and disappointing at the same time when when there are gurus and experts being positioned in the market because there can't be like the the industry is, sh is changing too quickly shifting too quickly so no one at this point should be an expert we should all be learning still we're, we're still students of this space um so we're hoping or i'm hoping our vision in terms of mlab is that we do start playing a role as at a regional level so that we start having a broader impact at a, at least a Southern African footprint because we know that talent and markets cross these borders. So we, if we're only focusing on South Africa, then our startups are stuck in South Africa as well. So we want to have a, a more regional footprint. To do that, the next two years of our core focus is to make sure that we expand now into provinces that are generally left behind in terms of these type of opportunities. So for now, we're going to focus on three new provinces. Um, we're going to build out those programs, make sure that investment goes there, make sure that the tech industry starts going there as well, that um, amazing programs at Startup Grind comes with us and, and does things in, in these other smaller cities as well. Um, and then my team is actually, hopefully by the end of this year, next week is our final administrative week for this calendar year, is come up with that final completely audacious goal that we are trying to achieve. And that would be um, really a big, big focus, big vision, which we believe is possible. Like we think it's possible to say that we want to support a thousand startups and help those startups generate a billion dollars in revenue over the next five years or so. But we will make that announcement when we come to it. But where we are at the moment is we're ready to kind of take a, a, a big view of this. Um, and hopefully when we started in 2011, we were quite 2011, 2012, we were, I would hope to say we were slightly ahead of the curve. Like no one was doing these type of accelerators yet. No one was specifically focusing on mobile apps at that point. The app economy was still evolving. Uh, we were very much a web-based uh, society. I hope that this, and that inspired many things to, to come, many other organizations, many spin-out programs um, and platforms that evolved. I'm hoping that this big audacious goal that we will put forward will then inspire other organizations to to kind of take the risk and publicly state what their big dream is, what they will achieve and get measured against. And at the same time, the startups as well. Like while I said earlier, we, we tend to want to try and solve really complex problems. We then also don't have those big audacious goals set for ourselves. We're like, oh, if we have a thousand users or we um, just have X amount of paying clients, we don't see enough people going into this game. And maybe that speaks to your question as well. And entrepreneurs coming in with very crazy big goals that they believe they can achieve, but know that there's hard work to do it. So we're hoping just to see that. Um, I would say I hope that we see a lot more 
of the creative industry starting to to mold into our ecosystem as well. We're there in terms of tech. Tech is amazing. Tech keeps evolving. It becomes more accessible and easy. Skills are developing. Um, but I think it's missing a little bit of artistic connection and, and really creating beautiful, beautiful technologies that people want to use. We build very functional things as a country, but we don't, not yet, creating like really beautiful stuff that people want to use. But we will be. We will be. Ladies and gentlemen, be. please follow Derek Kotze on social media or follow MLab SA. If you have any more questions, can your team just raise their hands? Please, Derek has brought his team here. If you could just chat to them and he will still be around to fold any questions that you might have. Derek, thanks a lot for coming here. And from us, a startup grind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank um, you very much. Can we have the business cards, please?